Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tonight, hosted by the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada, or CADAC for short. So the speaker tonight, um, as you see on screen, is Natalie Padicelli, and she'll be speaking on the topic of how to declutter when you have ADHD and, um, and are drowning in self. So tonight's presentation will be an hour uh, long, and then we will take the questions and answer them at the end. Um, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat box um, at the bottom and we'll, we'll take them at the end. Um, we sent out an email with two um, uh, handout and slides, and um, I will put them again in the chat and you can access them if you haven't got it already. Um, so I just put them out for everyone. Um, you can download and open it as um, the presentation um, is being uh, done. So with that said, I'll pass the time to uh, Natalie and um, we will begin right now. Yeah, so I recommend that you print out uh, one of the handouts is made like a workbook. And the reason that I create those rather than just letting you use the slides as is, my slides are very visual because of ADHD, we tend to be much more visual. It keeps you more engaged. And the more we write, the more we remember. Uh, so if it was all the answers were written on the slide, then chances are you're not gonna remember as much. So it's, I made them easy, so some of them are fill in the blanks, and there's some uh, graphs that are going to be useful tools for you to keep going for. So I highly recommend that you print them, and we're going to go along, and you'll be able to fill in the blanks uh, as we go along. So uh, just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions um, about the, the, each section that we're going to go through, I think I have about four different question periods. So put, ideally, you're putting the questions relevant to the section I just spoke about, and then at the end, we'll have all the questions that have not been answered that we can address. But it makes it easier for our moderator if you put three question marks before you write down uh, the actual question that you want to speak. Um, this is being recorded so that if you do not want your name being seen, I invite you to go on the box where your name appears on the top right hand side, you mouse over the, the corner, there are three dots and you can rename yourself. And by renaming yourself, then you can put it to whatever you want. Uh, you know, put your first name if you want to maintain uh, the privacy because this is being recorded and will be on YouTube afterwards. So uh, Fiona, you're continuing to accept people in, I'm gonna assume? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna go into screen mode to share. I'll put my PowerPoint up and we'll get going. So the uh, layout of the handout is, is very clear to follow along with the PowerPoint. So let me just, uh, I'm just gonna admit this prints. I need to click here. Go into full screen mode and I'll be right with you in a sec. Okay, and we're gonna get there. Thank you for your patience. And we are off. So welcome everybody tonight. We're gonna be talking about how to declutter when you have ADHD and are drowning and stuff. My name is Natalie Petticelli. I'm an ADHD organizer coach. So it's a professional organizer and coach all in one. And the reason that this is an important topic for ADHD um, in the professional organizing world, the three most difficult types of cases to work with are people who are seniors um, because they have mobility or sometimes dementia issues, memory issues, people who are uh, hoarders and a lot of people with ADHD fall in there because we have creative potential and everything. Uh, and people with ADHD. So uh, my specialty is ADHD and that's why we're gonna be talking about ADHD. All right, so we're gonna get going. I just wanna make sure the slides are moving ahead on your screen because I had one time where I was giving a presentation and the slides weren't moving. So just let me know, Fiona, if it's uh, static. So just a couple of housekeeping. If you have any questions, write them down on, you know, in the chat uh, going on the section. And I will highly encourage you to write and take notes. You will definitely remember, it's been scientifically documented that it's a better way to remember things. So we're gonna talk first about, about the effects of clutter. Perhaps you know someone whose uh, garage may look like this, or maybe not as bad, but the idea is uh, the stuff is make, uh, getting in the way of life in some respect or another. So effects on the home, certainly the more stuff you have, the harder it is to clean. So if you have, uh, you know, 12 items on your fireplace mantle versus two, you're more likely to dust when there's fewer things. Um, the stuff everywhere, it, it sort of creates a visual clutter 
for the mind. It could be a little bit unnerving for some people. And sometimes you also have trouble finding your things just because you, you can't see it even though it's out in the open because there's just so much stuff around it. We do have a hoarding tendency a little bit more because we create a potential and everything. Um, so that means we tend to hold on about some stuff with most people may feel like it's a no brainer, get rid of it. For us, we say we can turn it into things. I see a lot of people um, when they're disorganized comes with unopened mail and unpaid bills or they'll just open the mail look at the paper and shove it back in the envelope and that's what the worst thing you can do because you're, you're hiding it and you're going to forget to pay it and of course you have piles of stuff everywhere sometimes it's a bit of an obstacle course and uh, especially now during the pandemic most of us have uh, moved into a home office kind of setup or floating office if it's not a dedicated room and uh, it's if you do have a dedicated room it becomes the uh, dump zone where if people don't know where to put it they dump it in the home office and it becomes often what I call a room of shame or the dump and run room. So we want to avoid that because you know if it's a room that feels cluttered, you're gonna have a hard time uh, getting your work done. So the effects on the mind and health. Uh, we often see it as professional organizers, we get feedback from some of our clients who may be working with a mental health professional, like a psychologist. So you know the psychologist will notice the person has a better mood and it's like, well, I decluttered. I've been working with a professional organizer and that makes all the difference because they can see hope, they can uh, see their space, find their things more easily and it just reduces the overall anxiety because you know you'll feel more in control when you know where your stuff is. Uh, you know a lot of people I know don't invite people to their home because they're ashamed uh, about the state of their home uh, you know outside of a pandemic context and really you know we love where a lot of us are people we thrive with connection of people and that's really one way to um, make ourselves functional is to have an organized space where, that we're proud of and that we're be comfortable and often it, respiratory problems can come through asthma um, and dust that accumulates and sometimes if your house is just too stuff it's not just a question of of, um, of dust but it it becomes almost like there's a bit of a moldiness kind of smell because the air is not able to circulate as well when there's too much going on so bottom line, that physical clutter becomes mind clutter. So effects on productivity. Oh, sorry. Did, did, did uh, something happen? You don't see the slide? I heard somebody say a word. I heard loss. Fiona, can you still see the slide moving ahead? Hello? Yes. You, yeah. you can still see me and you can hear me OK? Yes. All right, it's just I heard somebody and then I thought there was a problem with the uh, viewing and seeing. The effects on productivity. Um, for certainly, you know, you may have papers, like, you know, going around all over your workspace and trying to remember things. And sometimes they've been there so long that you kind of forget about them. And part becomes part of the decor. And people get a little overwhelmed and they end up uh, being stuck and not moving forward. They go into inertia. They waste a lot of time looking for stuff. Um, I think with something as crazy as over a lifetime, people spend six months of their time just looking for their things. That's without ADHD. So amplify that probably times 10 with ADHD. And when your space is too congested, it really feels like it's much harder to work because you don't know where to put your attention to. The effects on relationships. Uh, perhaps you have a spouse who can't handle the clutter and stuff all over the place or the piles or feeling that we're walking through an obstacle course throughout the day. Uh, so it can cause arguments. Uh, already with ADHD, you know, organizing your space aside, it often becomes a parent-child dynamic where the neurotypical spouse starts kind of parenting um, and micromanaging the spouse with ADHD because they often will see the person has left a trail of where they've been and, um, and then they get frustrated because things are left out because we got distracted and went off, we went to do something else. So really it's an opportunity that when, to re reduce some of the conflict that may arise. And in extreme cases, it can lead to separation or divorce because somebody just gets fed up with the condition of the home, especially if there's hoarding tendencies involved in the process. Now, why is it so hard for us to organize when we have ADHD? Well, it's these wonderful things that are called executive function. Those things are located in the prefrontal cortex. And uh, I use here the, the, the Brown model, which are six areas where we have difficulty. 
one of the things it you know it's activation just getting started is so hard for us we're like that an 18 wheeler at a red light you, you know if you're in a car behind you don't want to be behind that truck because it takes so long to get going so that's the first thing right we just staying on task being focused and not getting distracted and like when you're sorting through stuff like memorabilia you might start opening the books and looking at stuff and then you just time flies we have no perception of time passage very well sustaining the effort making those decisions often people get decision fatigue because it's just like what about this what about that and it's just too much to go and go forward so really many areas of our executive functions are compromised with adhd and organizing is just one of those things that is difficult for us to do so it's very important that when you're going to take on some organizing projects to look at when is your prime brain operating time some people it's like something like seven to ten in the morning some people it could be nine to eleven at night but really this is something that which is kind of on the top harder things to do along with planning you know, in your agenda, and I'm sorry, we call it planners and agendas in French, planners in English. So these are things that you want to do when you have the most brain power. Things that don't require as much concentration for you or things that you love, you could do uh, at another time of day when your brain's not as optimal because when we love something, it's so much easier to do it. The effects of decluttering. Well, a study has shown that, amongst other things, it helps boost morale. It has a therapeutic effect I made reference to it about earlier. Some people are seeing it when they meet with their psychologists. Other people uh, see, of course, it has a positive impact on memory because, you know, when you can find your things more easily, you can remember where they were, like on a clear desk versus a desk that's full of stuff, you're more likely to remember that you put down your phone in that area. A positive impact on your focus. So uh, when you don't have too many things to pulling at your attention because they're out of your line, a site, Line, side of line, sorry, my line. Uh, it'll really make it a lot easier for you uh, to stay focused and concentrated on what you're working on. It helps with your mental uh, well being. And of course, all that, the less stress and overwhelm that you're feeling overall, it helps you really uh, get things going. So, do we have any questions so far, Fiona, that uh, people uh, have raised? No, not yet. Okay, good. We're going to move on. I'm just going to do, uh, okay, so now we're going to get into the steps. I call it, I use lots of acronyms to help uh, myself remember, but it also help people in general to remember. These are the five essential steps when you're in the process of decluttering. So use the word grads um, to remember. So we're going to go into the first step, which is, uh, first of all, before we actually step, we need some tools to be ready. Ideally, you want to wear things like lace up, uh, sneakers or running shoes. You don't want to be doing this in flip flops and sandals or heels because you may be moving boxes around, uh, you know, and you're going to be stepping over stuff. Uh, so really have something just for safety reasons. Have a water bottle nearby to make sure you stay hydrated. A timer so that you don't, uh, you know, lose track of time. You don't want to go overly too long because then you're going to get just so fed up of it and then it's going to turn you off while doing it in the future. Have some empty containers. It doesn't have to be boxes. It could be old shoe uh, boxes can be uh, cookie tins. Uh, I often uh, had clients, uh, I would bring on jobs, uh, empty mushroom containers. Those are great little plastic containers are great for organizing uh, small items or drawers. And uh, we often use an organizing a color code to the plastic bags with stuff that are leaving the house. So we would put anything that we're giving away to like friends and family goes in a clear bag to make sure it doesn't actually get, totally get thrown out. Stuff going to charity goes in orange, blue for recycling and green or black uh, for trash. So you have those uh, at the ready and it just makes it easier to uh, function. So the first step uh, we're gonna talk about, did I skip a page? Okay, I guess I have it afterwards. We're gonna do the ADHD friendly. If some of you have perhaps uh, have watched the show Hoarders and you often notice uh, they have a lot of friends and acquaintances are there. And unfortunately, some of them are judgmental and that doesn't help. Um, makes the situation easier, it actually makes the person more stressful, but they tend to take an approach, you know, they pick up an item, uh, you can't see it with some talking, you know, I've got a background, but the idea is they pick up an item and say, what about this, do you want it, you know, uh, yes or no, and, and it's constant barrage of pick up an item, make a decision, item, and just an item decision, and it just, person's overwhelmed. It's already emotionally charged, 
they're having to give away a lot of their stuff. So even without being case supporting, you know, that's not the way that I recommend to do it for ADHD. We really want to minimize the amount of decision making. So we'll take an approach that really um, reduces when the amount of decisions are done and when. Because these this kind of approach really taps into your executive function. It really um, puts a strain on them and it just becomes overwhelming and people will shut down. So a more ADHD friendly uh, technique is to do the first step is to group. So you might have, I use this example because it's my best way of showing it at home. Uh, our dishwasher was broken uh, one time and my adult uh, kids were also home and they just spread things. Uh, they, you know, they put the dishes there and uh, my husband freaked out uh, when he came home. I kind of made it a little bit more spread out than normal, but it's still usually pretty spread out because part of my argument, he'd say, why do you stack the dishes before washing them? Because it's a lot less overwhelming. The, what you see on the right, which is stacked like with like, is a heck of a lot less um, overwhelming in my opinion. It's the same amount of dishes that you see on the left. And sometimes just to get started, I just simply say to myself, when I don't feel like doing the dishes, you know what, I'll just wash uh, the dessert plates because that's easy. Well, oh, might as well do the big plates, I do the bowls and move on. I might skip the, the pots and pans and leave that to somebody else. But the idea is I'm tricking myself in a way Making by let, making it less overwhelming to get started on a task. So you can apply the same concept to when it comes to decluttering. So here's an example of how we approach that. So le, one of the things I often use a, to, to start with is the clothing. It's usually a less sentimental. For most people, it's not sentimental category. And you know you you can go around because so many times I go on client sites. There's clothing in various processes of uh, the laundry. So you have clothes in the washer that's wet, waiting to be dry. You have clothes in the dryer waiting to be folded. You've got clothes on uh, the dining room table or the couch, you know, clean, waiting to be, it be folded. You've got some on the floor in the laundry room waiting to be washed. And uh, a lot of stuff is also waiting to go back into their rooms. So what you want to basically do is gather up all that clothing, make one massive pile out of it. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to remove anything that might belong to a friend who came to visit you pre-pandemic and left behind their hoodie or their, you know, their kid left something and just put it aside and put it by the front door uh, so that you'll more likely remember to do it and, and put it in your planner. Then what you could do is just you're going to categorize. So you're going to make a pile for mom, a pile for dad, kid one, kid two, or whoever else with grandma and grandpa uh, lives in your house. And you're not deciding at this stage whether you're keeping something or not. You're simply just sorting. So it's basically when we were stacking the stuff. Then, you know, mom can start on her pile and uh, she can start separating, putting the dresses with the dresses, the pants with the pants, and the shoes with the shoes. Because then that allows you to see what you have. I had one client um, uh, who had uh, some tendencies you know, keep a lot of, of a bit more stuff than she needed. She, uh, we were working online and um, we had pulled out all her long, her pairs of boots that were long black boots. And she came to the first pair and I said, so what about these ones? She's like, well, I guess. And then she starts twirling her hair. I knew that that meant that she wasn't comfortable with this. And so I said, you know what? Try them on. Walk around to them. Tell me what you think. She's putting them on. It's like, oh, they're hard to put on. You know, she'd had these for, you know, since her, uh, her 20s and she was now in her 50s. She walked around and she said, mm, they're not super comfortable. I said, okay, try the next pair. Tries the same results, tight, not comfortable. Third pair, also tight and uncomfortable. Pairs four, five, six, and seven, they were easy to put on and take off and they were comfortable. So I said, okay, any of them you're able to let go? And she said, I'm getting rid of pairs one to three because they're not comfortable and they're hard to put on and take off. And then there was the stress was removed because she just tried them on. Because oftentimes people get recommended don't touch stuff. But when you know this, sometimes you do need to try things on before you can make a decision. And you're comfortable and you're not gonna go pick in the pile afterwards and bring stuff back. So if we take the pants as an example, uh, you could decide between keep and donate. So uh, stuff to donate are some of the obvious, you know, something that is more than two sizes too small or two sizes too big. Chances are, you know, uh, you're, you're not going to get back there. If you've lost a lot of weight, you know, reward yourself with a new wardrobe. Shoulder pads, 
and uh, you know, uh, paint your pants from the 80s, it's time to say goodbye. You could donate them. If there's items uh, afterwards that are left that you know you currently fit you, you know, and then they're fashion uh, passe, then you um, you remove those. You just go look back and see if there's anything here that you don't particularly feel comfortable in or that you don't like. Those are candidates to donate. Of the stuff after that that you've decided to keep, you can put them away and then do the laundry, and then you move to the next category, the, the dresses, and you go through the same process. So, and then you move into the shoes and etc., and you go from there. And then Dad does the same process with uh, his stuff, and then you help the kids go through theirs and get that done as well. Then we go into the release. That's letting go. So think of uh, frozen. So there are some essentials. Remember, I talked about those containers. We're going to have some that are going to keep some. That are, you know, we have the bags for donating. What I highly recommend that uh, we have when we do with ADHD is you're going to have a maybe box. Those are those things you're not so sure that you're really ready to let go. You can put them in there, and you can take you know a, a week or two to sort of think it over, or you do put it in there until you go do your next blitz of organizing. And then over time, you'll be comfortable, perhaps by the third or fourth time you go around and say, you know what, I'm ready, I don't really need this anymore. So again, it's not putting any pressure, but you have that option to just take a bit more time to think about it. The elsewhere box is really, really recommended for, um, or it could be a basket uh, when you're organizing space because, um, we don't want you to go drop it off something that doesn't belong in the room that you're currently in. Because if you go, what happens if you go put it in the other room, you might notice, oh, look, that's on the floor, pick it up. And then before you know it, you're, you've started another organizing site while the other one's not finished and uh, you won't lose track of time. Then you have an appointment to leave and then the whole house is a mess. So really this is the kind of thing where you would put it by the door and every time something goes in another room, you're not worrying about whether to keep or not. You're just going to deliver it afterwards when you finish organizing the current space you're in. And then you go drop it off in the room. Don't worry about, even if, if there's no designated place, just put it in the right room to start. That's really going to make a difference um, to help you stay on track and get less distracted. Now you say, yes, but how do I know if I should keep something or give it away? Well, here are a couple of questions you can ask yourself to help you figure out is it something that you should keep so first of all is it something you use it frequently i had one client who had hoarding tendencies that we were working you know, as a couple and his veto category where she had no stay over was tools uh, and his the basement was no longer usable because there was so much stuff so as much as I was, uh, his wife was trying to control it you know the basement was really not really usable so uh we came to a point where we had a bag of golf clubs. I said, do you play a lot of golf? He says, well, no, not really. I said, how often do you go? He says, oh, well, maybe uh, once every two years, I go play with my brother-in-law. So I said, okay, well, this takes up about four cubic feet of space. Would you rather have four cubic feet of, cubic feet of space of tools? Or would you rather have use it for a golf bag that you might use perhaps once every two years? He says, well, no, no, no brainer. He says, I would rather have tools. I said, okay, well, that's something that we can give away and that you can sell them. And then it, should you go back golfing, you can either borrow them from somebody or just rent them for the day. So that's one of the way of deciding to keep something or not. Do you absolutely need it? So if it's something that you use all the time, uh, that you, you need it, then keep it. If you have multiples of something, it, it's you no... Know, um, you can perhaps let go of some of them. You don't need to keep all of them. But you know, in our kitchen, we have four spatulas because some days we go through that many. So I wouldn't want, to, I'd be constantly <laughs> washing my spatulas. Uh, so we decided we four is what we need. So it's not necessarily always to have just one. Sometimes you need a bit more, but maybe not 12. We might have, uh, you know, four. Um, the other thing you could say is, is this, uh, there's only one of these needed to function. So we could make do with one spatula. We just chose that we needed four. Is, and is this your favorite items? You know, if items that you don't particularly care for or you're holding on because of guilt, uh, because they were given to you by a family member or a deceased loved one, 
is really not helping your cause. And, and if you're not honoring it, it's been sitting in a box in your furnace room for uh, 10 years gathering dust, you know, what's the point? So if you really, you're keeping it because you love that person, give it a place of honor. So bottom line, if you answered yes to these questions, you can keep it. So here's an example of another way of telling whether you have too much stuff. This was one of my first clients. Uh, she was a friend and uh, we were working in her kitchen, did the pantry. And I said, you know, you kind of got a lot of canned peaches and pears. So you know what, let's take a picture. We took a picture and I wanted her to realize for herself that she had a lot. So I did what we call a business case. Um, so I said, do you agree with me? This takes about three cubic feet of space. I said, yes. How many of these cans would your family of four eat in a month? Just perhaps one. Okay, if we do the math, you have 34 cans eating one per month. How long will it take you to go through these 34 cans if you don't buy any more until you've run out? Well, it was almost three years, which, you know, freshness comes into question. Then we costed it out. We gave a value to each can. The little ones were 50 cents. Mediums were a dollar. The big ones were $2. Well, that 34 cans represented $56 in money sitting in her pantry that was tied up and would take her three years almost to consume if she didn't buy any more. We did the same thing with uh, cake sprinkles that she'd buy the little jars for. It was one cubic feet, $84 would take her four years to go through it. So what we did is we created a list of do not buy. Uh, for the next time she went grocery shopping and she saved a lot of money over the next few months because she knew she had them because they were all in one place and she could really have a reality check. So the same principle can apply to a physical item. It doesn't have to be just food. You can still put some sort of value both in terms of state and cost. But the more important cost of all this is to also look at the emotional cost. What's your well-being being trading off? So you can spend a lot of time you know, I have clients who are organizing space, but in reality, they're just moving one pile from one space to the other. They have trouble letting go. And it's just causing friction with the family. Uh, you're getting stressed because they can't find stuff. They're always late because something, uh, you know, they, they can't get ready because they're missing items. So really, you have to ask yourself, what's, what's it worth for me to hang on to, you know, the last 10 years of National Geographic magazine that's taken up, you know, uh, a whole bookshelf Meanwhile, I have piles of other books that I love that are sitting uh, all throughout my home office. So these are things um, that you want to keep in mind. Then you want to address, give it a, a room where it will live uh, the items that you've sorted. So here's an example where you have permanent location. This is uh, my kitchen. It's a 50 year old kitchen, but uh, I'm a Tupperware addict. So I Tupperized it, but uh, everything is in one place. So uh, all the spices are together, all the baking stuff are on the top shelf, the soup stuff are on the left hand side. And this is the partial pantry because we don't have a big pantry room. So I had to make a, an adjustment like this. So the beauty of this is when your kids are old enough, they know where to find stuff and they learn to where to put it away. And you can quickly see when you need stuff. So you could see up here on the top right, uh, I've run out of popcorn. So I only have one place to look for popcorn. I don't have it in three, four places. So it goes on the grocery list really quick because a lot of people have uh, disorganized pantries and they have stuff that goes bad and expires. This is one way of staying on top of things. Uh, a lot of clutter comes from uh, stuff that's dropped just anywhere around the house. It's important to create a consistent drop zone, usually by the front door where the keys are. You might have the hats and mitts that are uh, in an area at this time of year and, uh, and you know, briefcase or knapsack and nowadays you also will have the, the Purell hand sanitizer. So it's at the front in a central location where everybody can find the stuff. Inversely, uh, when you have stuff going out, you want to prepare it uh, the night before when you're not pressed for time and uh, put it in, in a common agreed upon area with whoever lives in the house with you. So this is uh, from my Tupperware days. Uh, it was a Friday because I wrote right on the bag. I prepared it the night before and I had some deliveries to do. So it was all in the front there. So it really makes it easier to function when you leave the morning. You could even load your car the night before if you wanted to, uh, or you could do it the morning of, but it's a lot easier than trying scrambling, trying to remember what you need to bring with you that day and having to go back three, four times because you forget different items.
and it really, uh, it's, it's a focused area. In a general area uh, like this, this is a client whose husband built a little second lower uh, counter because he liked to fold the clothing and the counter was sort of overtaking well. The client who had ADHD ended up spreading and taking over two counters. Um, she had a home-based business and she was also uh, collecting uh, donation items for um, a, an animal rescue and it was prime location in the dining, uh, uh, the kitchen area. So we make an agreement where, uh, first of all, we, we, we put all the donation stuff that doesn't need to be in a, in a major place in the kitchen. We put it in the guest room, you know, in a corner where she could leave them until she was ready to bring them. But the other thing um, is to agree upon that perhaps the end of the peninsula of the counter is an area where the person with ADHD, ADHD is allowed to leave a couple of items there. Because if you put them, you know, in the back, in the corner, near the espresso machine, behind the, you know, almost behind the, the refrigerator, it's not in the main line of sight, we're going to forget stuff. And often the items that are there are prompting us to remind us to do a task, like maybe perhaps an empty pill bottle, because you need to renew the prescription. So you can have a virtual line, or if you, if, if it's not, uh, or you can even put painter's tape. And essentially, uh, the person with ADHD agrees to leave their stuff in the smaller portion um, at the end of the peninsula and the other person has permission that if, if you spill over, they can move it to the end of the peninsula. Because the worst thing can happen if your spouse gets frustrated with the pile, is they take your stuff and they go dump it somewhere else and then you're even more in trouble because you can find your stuff even less. Because at least you know when it was on the counter. Now it's in another room, it becomes problematic. Then we're gonna designate. That means finding the right container for things. So it doesn't have to be expensive. You can start off using shoe boxes and cookie tins and mushroom containers I talked about earlier. And once you realize that's the right place where it goes, it's about the right size, then you can go out and invest in containers. Because a lot of times people already have enough containers of Rubbermaid, Sterilites, and all the other brands that at home. So here's an example of what's optimal. These were for two young uh, boys who had ADHD. These containers are from Ikea. You can buy them without the lids. Because in this case, the lid would really be an obstacle. We put the items that were uh, more like paint and glue and stuff at the top out of reach, but everything else is in a see-through container and labeled. And this applies for adults as well, that you know, see-through is better for ADHD and labeling is a must. Uh, sometimes you don't need the, uh, the lids uh, in some context. In some context, you need to just keep the dust out. So another example here, this is not uh, a job I did, but because there are no, there are no labels, I would never <laughs> organize something without labels in non see through containers. So you absolutely would have um, labels in here. But the idea, what I want to show you here is this is perfect because nothing is stacked on top of each other. Because what happens when things are stacked two or three high and you want the one on the bottom, well, you're gonna move the other ones off the shelf. You're gonna go into your container and often with ADHD, it's not guaranteed that we're gonna remember to put everything back. So if it has just the right height uh, and its own shelf, it's a better chance that things will get put away. When it comes to uh, some of the paperwork, we're gonna talk about how to sort them, but just a general way when you're designating uh, like a file cabinet is to designate colors and, and give them meaning. So I had a client who was a real estate agent. She happened to have a lot of red, blue and yellow folders. So I said, well, what if we were to put uh, red for like hot listings, right? They're current, they're active or they're clients you're going for. And then we, the ones that have uh, you lost the, the contract or were taken off the market go blue and the ones in between that you need to revisit are yellow. I just, oh, that's perfect, I totally get it. On the picture on the left here is it was a client who uh, all her financial stuff, she uh, had salvaged regular green hanging folders from work that were being thrown out. So she went to the dollar store and we used some tape. So what we put the financial stuff is what's in green. And uh, basically she hates finances. Green's her least favorite color and it's also the color of money. So that's how she remembered that that was all, anything to do with finances. The stuff that's really important, all the bills for the home are in that rainbow color and the fun stuff like hobbies and stuff were in that little leopard print. So by putting an emotional thing that, that can help. Uh, the one on the far right, the colors mean uh, to keep for the duration of the time. That's an actual system um, that will really help you. But it, so anything that's in red is kept in permanence, where it's yellow, it's kept for the year, and if it's blue, it's tax related. And, uh, and that's one way of, of doing it. 
I'm not going to go be too much beyond that because that's not the purpose of it. We're not, I can go on for an hour just on filing systems. So the last step is to service. So that's what you can have the most organized space, but if you don't pick up after yourself, you're going to be, be back in a mess really quick. So you need to pick up for yourself. The easiest strategy to do, especially if you have children with ADHD, uh, is to create, we called it a sanity basket. We had put it in our main entrance where the, near where the launch pad was. And basically the understanding was that if the kids left their shoes, their school books, or their toys lying around, rather than nagging them to pick up or just pick, you know, bring it to their rooms, we would put this in the sanity basket. And uh, we would basically, uh, once a week, they understood that if they didn't empty it out, the, the basket would get uh, either dumped in the garbage or go to charity of the contents. So trust me, it doesn't take very long to do that. And this is really something that you can implement tonight. When it comes to your spouse who has ADHD, you can have a, a separate basket for your spouse, but we don't want really, I wouldn't do the dumping the stuff uh, you know, in the garbage. I would just basically say, honey, uh, can you, uh, you know, take care of your basket? So that what happens then when your kids or your spouse who has ADHD doesn't know where their stuff is, you can say, well, if it's not where it belongs, you know where to look, go look in the basket. So it really helps uh, diffuse some of the nagging that would otherwise ensue. Uh, definitely uh, for ADHD, aim for hangers, or sorry, hooks over hangers, especially if they're teenagers, because teenagers uh, consider the floor as a shelf. So, uh, hooks are more likely to happen because as hangers what happens especially if your closet is stuff you got to push things to get pull out the hanger then you know if you're putting clothes on it you got to start to fit it in you might have to button or unbutton and try to get it back in. it's too many steps so make it easy for them get a, a, a series of like you know half a dozen to a dozen hooks if they have some that can hang off of doors that you don't even have to drill any holes it really will make all the difference do it for little kids, you might have a system, for example, if they have a uniform for school, to, when they come home, they take off the clothes because it's good for maybe two days. Uh, then you can have a, um, a sun. And on the, the moon icon below that, that's where the pajama goes. So they know that a uniform goes under the sun when they take it off and the pajamas, when they take them off, they go under the moon. So it just really makes it a lot easier to function. This is uh, for stuff that are leaving your home. You can create a sorting station, like perhaps in your garage, some other place, or it's in the basement if you don't have a garage. Uh, this is in my home. So I had one for the returns, the hazardous waste, the donations, and the stuff on the left was for a, a garage sale pile. It didn't fit in the basket. But just by the fact that you have it lined with the plastic bag, uh, it, you know, when you're ready, it's filled, you just grab the bag and off you take it to the donation center or hazardous waste. So it's really easy. You just get the super higher, uh, not the low baskets, but the ones that have a much higher uh, shape. So the whole process that we basically did with the clothing, you can repeat it in other areas or categories. So you could try it in the kitchen and say do uh, cutlery items or, or you know, cooking utensils. Uh, or the pantry, or you could just do by a category that goes all around the house. Like paperwork is usually stuff all over the house and toys. So those are things that you could do. So you choose one and really focus on that. Try not to do everything at once. Really tackling things smaller step at a time is the best way to go. And here we're in stage where uh, we're gonna sort through paperwork. It's the same principle that we did when it came to the clothing. So any paper that's not currently filed, you would just go in the various rooms, bring them all together. It could be those little loose notes of paper, uh, post-its. It could be old envelopes where you wrote some information on and just bring them together. Now, the first step is to take out the obvious stuff like the sales flyers, uh, newspapers, and uh, you know, coupons for restaurants you're never gonna go to and like that. But the rest, don't worry about is it good or not good at this stage. What we're gonna do is like, for example, a lot of people right now are working from home or have a home-based business. So you, like one of the first natural splits you could do is separate business from personal. And so we're gonna be dealing with a lot fewer piles at one time than you would in the normal scenario. Because oftentimes people have a big pile and they start separating and they end up with like 14 piles around them. They get distracted uh, and the phone rings, they go on the conversation. 
and then they forgot that they were in the middle of filing uh, sorting papers and they go in another room and do something else and before you know it the dogs jumped on the bed mess them up or your spouse is what the heck is this and just puts everything together and or you simply forget what you were you know the, the categories so this is a much better approach again we're not making decisions as we handle each paper we're just sorting them into piles so the step for example here is we take the personal pile and we would separate it into adults and kids stuff so we're not going to be deciding on whether we're keeping the number the numerous pictures of our little budding artists uh, and school papers and reminders right now we're, we're just going to simply put them aside in a pile and then we'd go through the adult stuff so the adult stuff a lot of the times those could be bills so we would separate just bills and everything else goes in another pile once we have bills then we could take the bills and then we can separate them into between paid and to pay so if something is paid then what you could do uh, if you don't need them if you're not uh, using them for income tax purposes like a home-based business then you can either trash uh, recycle or shred and otherwise you can file them uh, because it's not something that you're likely to be consulting on a regular basis so that could be like your income taxes as well are the types of things that you can more put like archives that can go in a box in the storage space in the basement the bills that are unpaid those ones you'll put them into action now that can be for example putting them into your planner and writing down pay your bills um, I, I personally even though i have the option of going online for the physical bills i prefer getting them in paper because it creates uh, another visual reminder for me so what you can do is either put them to pay later and post date online or you can pay them right away and uh, so when that's done with the bills you move on to the other pile for adults and then you would separate that into other categories for example you could separate any that's financial reports income taxes uh that's all money related so that could be the next category that you split and go through and then you have another category of stuff that often comes up like warranties and instructions and then you might have other stuff that's memorable so you just take tackle them one pile at a time and just removing what doesn't fit that first criteria and you'll eventually get through and oftentimes at the beginning it's a little bit slower but people will often I, there's a point where i could see it they, they just it just clicks and then they're like they, they become so much faster at processing things so really it's only at the end that we're deciding whether we're keeping or not keeping so when we sort everything down to this criteria, you're really reducing the decision fatigue. And by the end, a lot of people will say, you know what, I don't need this. And they, they throw a lot more by the end. So it's the way to go. Do we have any questions, Fiona, at this stage? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. So um, uh, going back to the handout uh, PDF that you sent yep. on page, uh, page four, um, you have uh, Oh, you've, I, I, I've lost you. You blanked out there, Fiona. Could you repeat? Uh, for for uh, these label sorting boxes for. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So page four of the handout PDF. So under release, um, label sorting boxes for MDDS. Oh, yes. The other one was for cell. Can you. Uh, what the, the S is for cell. Yeah, can you and. Yeah, there, there are four letters, yeah, right? What, uh, Yes, yes, well, our MDS. So the E is for elsewhere basket. The M was for maybe box, the ones that you're not sure to get rid of. The elsewhere goes in another room. The S was for cell. And what's the fourth letter? Uh, S, M E. No, well, there was S for cell. And what was the other uh, one? E. E v. was for elsewhere. So V. Is it? Uh, v. So I'm having a hard time hearing you. There's a bit of an echo. D. A, B, C, D, D. D, uh, donate. Oh. Okay, because sometimes the bags get full too fast or the items are just too bulky to put in the garbage bag. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Second, yeah, we have a couple of questions. So um, the next one is, um, what about keeping sentimental items? Um, items that hold memories or associated with the people who have passed away? Right, so there's two different things. One of the things is you could take a picture of the item so that you have the memory of it uh, and you can you can donate the actual item uh, the other thing too is for example you have t-shirts or clothing that belong to that person you could maybe convert them into a cushion or a or put them in make the quilt out of them 
uh, kids stuff that you can have them uh, laminated and make them into posters. Uh, when it's things like furniture, it's a little bit more awkward. So that's where you have to sort of say to yourself, it's again, if it's sitting in the garage, it's been or out in the, you know, outside with the weather, it's gotten damaged over time. You're really not honoring that person. You say to yourself, why did that person give it to you? Like say it's something that belonged to your family. It's because they thought you might enjoy it. And you can, uh, you know, celebrate and put it in a place of honor, or you can give it to somebody who really would benefit from it. Like it really, why we're keeping it sometimes it's out of guilt. So uh, you want to be able to live more comfortable. Your, your, your person who passed away, they really want you to be happy. And if you're feeling miserable because you're having to manage this, your spouse is getting on your case, they want them uh, to be able to park their car in the garage in the winter, not have to move the snow, and it's causing fights. Well, at some point, you have to ask yourself, what's more important, my relationship with my spouse? You know, I, I want them to be happy and help them, you know, have space in the garage or is it hanging on to something that I don't particularly care for? I cared for my grandmother, but the item itself, I don't particularly care for. So it's more celebrating your grandmother, putting pictures up of your grandmother instead, or, you know, and put a picture of the piece of furniture because maybe that was where she put on her makeup, but you don't wear makeup, right? And you don't have a need for it. So those, that's one of the ways of addressing it. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, what kind of uh, labels do you recommend? Is there any special types? I personally like the uh, the P Touch uh, Brother label makers. Um, there are some. Uh, uh, the tapes can be a bit expensive. The cartridges they're in the twenty dollar range each. There are some knockoff companies. You just have to be a bit more cautious. Like from experience, they tend to more likely to jam and they don't stick as well. Certainly, if you're doing something for outdoors, use the the brand names, not the uh, the imitations. The other thing too is you could use, um, you can make your own on a printer. You buy some Avery or make some of those, or Staples has an equivalent. It's a whole page. It's made like a sticker or you can have labels and you can have them take the ones that are removable so that if you decide you want to take them off, you're not going to have problems. So these ones can be easily repositioned. And you can even use pictograms, print up uh, some images, even for an adult. Uh, so those are some ideas that you could do. But you always put it, uh, in, in the direction of the container is going to be facing. Sometimes I actually will put it on two sides uh, or even on top, depending on how, we, when you come up to the item, you can your angle of the box. So if it's an, a box that's on a lower shelf, then I would write on top for sure, on top of the box, I put a label. If it's something up high, then I want to be able to see the label. There's no point putting it on top. I need to put it at a lower surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, other questions? Uh, yes, so um, for an item that you need to use that, uh, so let's say a casserole dish, and let's say you have two uh, dishes, one big and you only need to keep one. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't um, afford to, to replace it if it breaks, so how do you um, decide if, uh, how to let go? Well, that? I would personally keep the bigger one just because it gives me more options. And, you know, I learned this when I was with my kids uh, were young. I opted to, for a lot of the, the toys and books, I went and bought everything secondhand. I saved so much money. And the other thing too, is that the minute they outgrew something, I would sell it back. And a lot of times I made my money back. Sometimes I even was able to sell it for more than I actually paid for it. So you say to yourself, there's enough secondhand stores out there that uh, for something more utilitarian, you know, that's not a, a, an artwork, like, you know, a, a hand-blown glass uh, vase uh, that you can have uh, really easily replaced with secondhand stuff. So that's the approach that I take. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, how about electronic decluttering? Like, um, uh, yeah, uh, electronics is a little bit more iffy. Uh, like I know very little about electronics. So we do have a pile that goes in the box. I trust my husband will go through it and stuff that's still usable. Uh, I have uh, in my community, there's a, a Facebook group called Buy Nothing. It's in a different country. And essentially, if you have something you don't want, you put it on, uh, it's still usable, not broken. You put it in the group to gift. And people will say, I'm interested, I'm interested. And you can randomly pick somebody or you pick whoever you want to give it to. Uh, or you could, there's sites like Free Cycle, F-R-E-E-C-Y-C-L-E, -E -E, that you could just say, I have a box of old electronics. Some people like to play around with those and make things. Uh, I'll leave it at my front door, pick it up whenever you want. That's another so example my, of what you could do. 
my question so we'll was actually about, like, about electronic decluttering um like about email inbox organizing oh okay well we're, we're not going to be covering that do you have any best practice or tips or tricks that have worked for clients in the past with that i'm not going to go too much into detail because that could be again a topic in itself like the filing systems but essentially one way is you can emulate your filing system on paper so how you categorize your folders on the paper side you can categorize your your emails and other documents the same way uh personally i i have in my folders of digital folders that I keep, I, I try to emulate to some degree. The emails I would tend to uh, to do um, more like I have one folder where anything I order or uh, I'm waiting a response for somebody goes in there. And I have a couple ones for apps. Uh, I have stuff that's membership, like my insurance company and uh, you know anything else that goes in there or if I'm an affiliate of something. And I don't have too many folders for my email. If there's a, a webinar that I've signed up for, but I'm not going to listen right away, when I get the email saying, here's a, the recording, I will put it in the folder webinar and eventually I'll go look uh, and listen to them afterwards. But I try to stay on top and clean as much as possible. I, it's hard to have a, a very empty box, but the idea is if some of them are tasks, I will transfer them into my planner as action items. So that could be a topic that could be addressed uh, separately. I, I, I won't have time to go into more detail than that right now. Uh, or, you know, um, so it's something that we could address a little bit later date. So I will, uh, if there's no other questions right now, I'll move on to a couple of little strategies, like when you're stuck. Is that okay, Fiona? Or are there a lot more questions coming up? Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I'll move to the next section. So where to start? A lot of people don't know. Where do I start with? So here's some suggestions. Start with the common areas, the living rooms, dining rooms, family rooms, and kitchen because you have a lot of people in there and perhaps you have a spouse that's getting a little frustrated or the kids are, can't find their stuff. Now the place, is, the place that causes you the most uh, distress. So right now it could be, uh, you know, the dining room because you're trying to use it as an office and then the kids are doing their homeschooling in there and it, it causes a lot of issues. It could be the place that your spouse nags you the most about because you just want to address that and, you know, calm that front. Uh, so that it's easy to function. You may want to take the place that generates money. So you have a home office or your workspace, which is often the dump and run room, uh, you know, the room of shame where everything that doesn't have a home goes. You want to make that functional. You don't want to be in a place where you're having to step over toys and Christmas decorations when you're having conference calls, uh, you know, with your coworkers or clients. It doesn't look very professional. The other thing too is to think macro before micro. So the way I see this is like, don't worry about the drawers of your, like say your little office supplies, work on the big items first. And uh, the big items have more impact. It'll give you more motivation when you clear a space. Then you start going into the micro, the opening the drawers of office supplies, the, you know, the socks and underwear and things like that. And categories that are less emotional. So if you are the person who has furniture that belonged to your great grandmother, that your grandmother passed on to your mother who passed it on to you because they don't want it anymore, but they don't feel the guilt anymore because it's gone to a family member, but you don't care for it. Keep that as one of the last ones. Do the stuff that like, you know, uh, kitchen utensils and clothing and books are often less emotional. So start with those. You'll get more comfortable. You'll make some positive impact and it'll give you the motivation to move to the harder stuff. Paperwork is usually for ADHD, what I recommend as the last thing to be tackled. Um, you know, sometimes just putting it like in a box, it's like the sorted and unsorted pile. That makes it a lot more approachable because this is very, very demanding on executive function. So I keep that last. Now you're probably saying, well, how do I overcome the overwhelm? Well, what some of the strategies that you could use all right, so I'm moving forward here. Hold on a second. My computer's stalling a bit here. Come on. Okay, is to use blankets or tarps to cover up a certain area to basically reduce the visual clutter and it'll make it easier for you to focus on one corner of a room uh, uh, or to cover like the piles that you're not addressing, you're to focus on the one pile of paper or clothing. Take baby steps. Start small. Just say, I'm just going to work on, you know, this little area here or this smaller category. Don't start redoing an entire closet right away. That's a little bit overwhelming. 
You can also use hula hoops. Uh, they often use that with people on, uh, who have hoarding tendencies just to keep them focused in an area. And you work what's, where the, what's in that zone of the hula hoop. And make sure you take a, a reward break so that you know that, okay, after I spend 15 minutes or half an hour working on a spot, I have permission to go have a hot chocolate or I have permission to, uh, you know, go listen to some music or you can have even music while you're working, but you can have to go take a dance break, for example. How do you move into action? Because that's one of our big problems is getting started. We know what to do, but we're not moving into action. Wait for my computer to move forward. <laughs> Some reason I guess it doesn't like the other subsequent pages. So it's to touch it. Remember when I talked about the kitchen dishes, sometimes when I don't feel like doing it, what I do is I just pick up one item and then in a standing position, we're much more likely to move into action than if we're sitting down. So if you just start touching the item and look at it, and then it's more likely to help you get started. Make sure you take your medication. For me, medication helps me a lot with activation. I can do it. Uh, I will get e more easily uh, unhooked from my, I'm a TV addict, right? So I have timers on my TV, but medication helps me really get my day started much quicker than if I don't have medication. It also helps me stay much more focused on boring tasks for longer periods of time. Put on some music, make it fun uh, when you're sorting. And you can also create anchors. So where you could say at the beginning of the day, uh, you have an appointment either with a friend or you can go on an application like focusmate.com. That's F-O-C-U-S-M-A-T-E.com. Essentially, you, uh, you say on Friday at 9 a.m., I want to do some decluttering. So you make an appointment you're going to be matched with somebody around the world who also needs a, a social accountability buddy. And you'll just say, hi, I'm working on decluttering. They say, I'm studying for an exam. You can say mute or unmute the background noise. And after 50 minutes, the timer goes off and you've done some work. And you could do this three times a week for free if you want to use it more than three times a week. It's simply a small $5 US per month, very affordable. It was an application that was designed by somebody who had ADHD. So that's an anchor because it forces you to be at your desk or at your, uh, you know, at your computer ready to work because you've made a commitment to do it. How to stay focused when you have ADHD. All right. For some reason, these second slides <laughs> as the strategies are really, my computer is not happy with processing. Thankfully, we don't have too many to go through. Okay, this create obstacles. So, uh, you know, one of my traps is TV. Netflix is about the worst thing for me because I can one more episode, one more episode in, you know, in my brain, but my body is not moving. And, you know, when I say it's time to go work. So I put timers and 11 o'clock at night, TV shuts off so that I go to bed. Uh, that's an example. You can announce your deadline. So uh, I have run a couple of support groups, one in French and one in English. And some members in the support group use the group to announce, okay, uh, this week, I'm going to tackle uh, some of those online courses that I uh, started off. And then they come back a week later and they, and they started when they hadn't done anything for years. So it's decluttering their virtual courses that they've done. Um, the other thing is you can anticipate some distraction and preemptive behavior. So if you know chances are at some point while you're working that your kids might want to have a snack or their, their lunch, well, make it before you start organizing. Put something at the ready. Let them know where it is when it's time. Uh, you know, uh, the other stuff, the preempt behavior. So if you know your phone is a distraction, put it in another room uh, or, you know, they have these things called the, the K-safe. It's like a, a box with a lid and there's a timer that can lock it up for three minutes, three hours or three days. And uh, those are the things that are pulling your attention away. And you can work with the Pomodoro technique uh, that, it's that you can work with any timer. The principle is you do like 25 minutes of work five minutes break. So the idea is if around minute 17, you're like, oh, I'm getting bored with this. Well, you say to yourself, I can hang in for another eight minutes because I'm allowed to take a break after eight minutes. So it really helps with helping you stay on track and focused. The other things to watch out for, uh, for distractions are the, usually the electronics. I call it falling down the Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole. So just like we did the business case for when it was too much stuff, we can do the business case for uh, when it comes to checking on Facebook. I had a young entrepreneur 
uh, who uh, I'd asked him, you know, how often do you go on, on social media? He said, oh, I only go on Facebook about twice an hour. I said, okay, how long do you go every time? Oh, never more than 10 minutes. I said, okay, do you agree with me? Two times 10 minutes, that's 20 minutes. Like, yeah. Okay, studies have shown that it takes anywhere between four to eight minutes when you're distracted to get back and focus. And that's without ADHD, okay? But we'll be conservative. We'll estimate four minutes times two, that's eight minutes to go see what your friends had for dinner, what they did last night. So uh, plus the 20 minutes that you're actually on Facebook. So how many minutes is that? 28 minutes out of one hour that you're going on Facebook to check what your friends did last night and what they had for dinner. That's okay, what's your hourly rate? Uh, 100 bucks per hour, okay. So 28, so almost half of that 100 hour has gone wasted because you went on Facebook. So he quickly realized, okay, I got to use this time to meet with clients rather than that. Because he realized he was, you know, throwing out about 40 odd dollars an hour just to go on Facebook when he could have been working with clients. So that's an, another way of helping convince yourself. I had another client who was a building inspector. He says, okay, I'll do it after nine o'clock at night, not during prime appointment times. How to surmount perfectionism. It sounds counterintuitive, uh, but people with ADHD have a perfectionism streak. I think it goes back to the fact that we've always been told, shut up, sit down, be quiet, stop moving, you're annoying. And now here we are as adults, uh, and now we're always trying to be perfect and make things happen. So you would do is you brainstorm the requirements to figure out what is it that needs to be done, plan your project. And sometimes we just have to stop superwoman, super manning, you know, just do a bit less. You know, done is better than perfect. And I'll repeat that because it's really important. And a lot of people, ADHD professionals say it, done is better than perfect. And make sure you reward yourself. So here's an example of our basement uh, that was uh, my husband's spot, so it's not organized. I gave him his there. And we went in here, he says, I want some of those wall things to organize. And I went, hallelujah. I found him the product. It's time you want to get organized. Well, he decided to do the organizing and that was the result. And if I had done it, my perfectionism would have said, Okay, well, we can't install that on the wall. The wall's not painted, but I can't paint the wall because if you see on the right -hand side of the window, the gyp rock is missing because the window leaked a couple of years back and we never fixed it. So I got to go to the store, buy the gyp rock. I got to cut it, patch it, let it dry, sand it, and then I'm from prime paint and then and I'm exhausted and I haven't even done any organizing because my standard was you can't install this on a, a wall that's unpainted. But for him, he didn't care. So that's establishing you know, what are the premises? And you may want to put a deadline to it to say, okay, if it's not done by a certain uh, date, do I have the permission that if you don't do it? I can hire them and you negotiate that. So that's one way of getting over the perfectionism. And lastly, just another 30 seconds on getting help. Get a body double. That's a buddy who can be there to support you. Make sure it's not somebody who's going to criticize your decision or your items or the speed you're going at. They're just there to keep your brain busy while you sort and keep you company. You can have the accountability partner, those anchors I talked about, like focus mates, or it can be another buddy, but make sure again, it's not somebody who's gonna go on a conversation while you're trying to do, but the idea is you're gonna report back to them uh, on your progress. Uh, just to say, I made it done, it puts a little bit of pressure on you and uh, it'll help you move. You can hire a professional. So you have professional organizers, you have coaches uh, that can help you with that. Bottom line, what I want you to know is when you're gonna start, you know, typical ADHD will go in like super overdrive and, uh, you know, uh, anything they want to do, they'll do it at an excessive amount, but it's not sustainable over the long time. A neurotypical person, when they start it, they'll start it and they'll just get better at it. So for us, we're going to go up, we're going to go down, we're going to stop doing it and go back. The idea is, is our ability to succeed will be based on our ability to get back up and continue and move on to it. So we can succeed, we just have to do it differently and in smaller steps. So uh, just keep that in mind and you will succeed. So that's basically it. We have our last uh, question period um, that um, we can have. So I don't know, Fiona, any other questions that have come up? Uh, uh, yes. So um, can you repeat the name of the app that you uh, mentioned? Focusmate.com. So let me just get out of the uh, view. I can put it in the chat. Um, and it's really good. And you have to show up because if you don't show up three times in a row, they'll block you from using it because you have somebody at the other end who's going to be disappointed. It's 
sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. I'm on share here. I'll put it in the chat. So it is, oh, I keep clicking on share. <laughs> Apologies. Trying to do two things at once. So I'm just going to put it to everybody. So it's focus mate, like a buddy, dot com. Any of the other questions? Yes. So um, how do you balance, um, you know, seeing the potential of the item um, um, and the usefulness of it? Well, that's where you have to have a serious conversation with yourself. Because if you have a, a history of salvaging stuff by the side of the road or taking on anything, you know, somebody that wants to get rid of something and say, oh, you know what? Uh, I, oh, I know that uh, Jessica will take it. She'll take that. She'll take that anything. And then you end up with a problem. Um, you, you end up self-sabotaging. You have to have a conversation with yourself. You know, the, the, the probability of me doing this and converting and painting it and especially if it's reselling, it's not even for your own personal use, are, are low because you haven't done it for years. So what I would recommend is pick one or two of them, the ones that you think are most likely to happen that excite you the most, and the others bite the bullet and let them go and stop picking some stuff up. Or if you're going to pick up something by the road, you get another one out so that you're like a neutral, you're not adding, you're uh, at least maintaining. So really, you, you have to approach it like that. So I have some, uh, I had a, I was a phase when my kids were uh, under 10 where my mother-in-law was teaching me to knit and it was about three quarters done. And then for whatever reason, I stopped and then it sat there for seven or eight years. And I said, you know what? I'm never going to finish this thing. And by then I wasn't the same size as I was when I initially started the sweater. So I just gave it away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same, thank same you. thing with the fondue set, right? I love fondue, but you know, I, I had a hard time in getting my husband to uh, have a fondue meal on my birthday and said, well, if it's not going to end my birthday, I'll never have it. So if ever I want fondue, I'll just go to the restaurant. So okay. other questions? Um, yeah. What about the urge to sell items um, or maybe to monetize the value that um, you so, may justify? Two different things uh, on that. I often, some people want to sell everything. So you have to balance that while this item is not selling, it's going to be sitting somewhere. If you don't have a garage, it's probably going to end up being in your living room or family room, congesting that space. So you have to say, is it worth trying to sell a kid's t-shirt for 50 cents versus a dresser that I can sell for 50 bucks? Well, I would focus on the big items, the bigger prices, the smaller things. Now, if you are a single parent and every penny counts, then yes, do it. But it, it is very consuming uh, on the executive functions because you got to take a picture of the item. You got to go load it and then you got to describe it. Uh, I, if you're going to do that, I would do it so that people come to your home that you're not going to be meeting them in the middle of somewhere where they may show up, may forget the appointment for like a $2 item. It's not worth your time. You want to move forward. So sometimes it's just better bite the bullet, give it to a donation center if like you love dogs and your local pet rescue is having a garage sale, well, donate it and give it to them or just give it to a friend or an acquaintance because it's not worthwhile to have a room that's unusable because you're waiting to sell for low priced items. So bigger items that may be worth your while. So just have it in an exchange group can help. Mm -hmm. okay. Next question. Um, can you talk about uh, uh, holding um, that uh, extra difficult during pandemic and lockdown uh, periods. It's it has gone from uh, being difficult to manage to insane this time. Well, that's why I started participating in in March in this buy nothing group because a lot of the charities were not taking donations, and rather than accumulating in my garage, a lot of people did take the opportunity, uh, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, to declutter. So I go in this uh, buy nothing group and I just post the stuff. Like now I've gone through some uh, CDs. We don't have a CD player anymore. Mm -hmm. I have puzzles. I love puzzles, but I don't, you know, they're expensive to buy brand new. It can be $15, $20 for a puzzle. Right now we're circulating puzzles. We take precautions when we pick them up. And I'm, and I'm cautious to donate way more than I give, uh, than, I, than I get. Uh, just because I don't want to be uh, congested. So that's one way of doing it to find these uh, giveaway swap groups. There's no expectation on the other end that you have to trade or, or these free cycles. So really that's an approach to take uh, because the more you hang on to stuff uh, you do, if you have stuff that you've made the decision to let go, 
and you, you do have drop off points that are still collecting, then put it in your front passenger seat though, so that it's annoying and in your line of sight. You put it in the trunk, people are gonna, you're gonna forget it and you may sit there for months. So every time somebody wants to use the front seat, you have to move this bag around. At some point, you're gonna go drop it off. So we are more, tent more likely to do hoarding. If it's to the point where it's items of very little value that you're still holding, maybe it's time to speak with a, a professional who handles um, obsessive compulsive uh, behaviors because that's hoarding falls under there. So if you're having trouble letting go of like items that can be recycled, like uh, um, bottles and jars and uh, things like that of very little value and it's blocking access to your doors or rooms, you have more than one room that's non-functional, then that's where you may want to ask. Um, Attitude Magazine has a questionnaire, am I a hoarder? It's something that you can go uh, try out if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes, um, any advice for parents um, uh, with ADHD adults at home and um, during the process- adult, adult children? Yes, so the parent-child um, dynamics are, but is a little bit difficult and any advice on that? for both like parents and, and, and children. Okay, so what's that? when they talk parent-child dynamic, it's usually between spouses. One has ADHD, one does not. And by the way, I am giving in French on February 11th a talk uh, that was given in English a while back at conference by uh, Heidi Bernhardt, uh, the founder of Kodak. So it will be in, uh, in October and we'll be talking about uh, the couple's relationship. But essentially, you, you want to just uh, help them by using the sanity basket, putting the stuff there, because there's no point nagging the more you nag, the more the other person will either do one of two things. The person with ADHD is either going to shut down or they're going to blow up and it's not going to help the situation. So you just neutralize your language uh, rather than saying, you didn't put out the garbage. How many times do you, I have to remind you a six-year-old could do this. You just simply say garbage and they're like, oh yeah, I got to go do it. So you could do the same thing with the task, but don't give verbal cues, write it down. We're much more visual. Are more likely to remember to have reminders so if you want them to organize the space maybe it's just helping them getting them started uh you know let me start with you i'll do this and then once they get started you can move to another room come in and check once in a while but don't say uh you you know you just remind them oh by the way you have a bag that's full let me take it out for you so you're you're neutralizing conversation rather than being judgmental that can help a lot mm -hmm. okay um can you um, uh, make suggestions for someone who cannot take medications? Um, uh, when you talk about the steps to, to move into action, you mentioned medication. Well, medication is one thing. You, do, you can manage your ADHD without medication. A lot of people do resort to medication, but they don't use just medication. So certainly all the other ways of managing your ADHD, sleep, having a regular sleep pattern, good number of hours of sleep, you know, if you're going to bed at, uh, at two one day and at 10 the other night, it's not good on your, your body. Having good nutrition. So if you're eating junk food takeout all the time, uh, that's not helping your body. You want to have uh, less processed food that's lower in salt, fat, and sugar. The other thing, exercise. So even if you're not the most exercise-oriented person like me, well, I, I now have an under-desk elliptical. I don't use it under my desk, but basically it's like a bicycle without two wheels, it's just, uh, I, I pedal and I set it in front of my TV. I uh, have my iPad, I play my video game. And I went from doing maybe uh, one mile once or twice a week. And now I do five, uh, 10 miles at a time, five to seven days a week. So you, I started slow and I built that up. So that's exercise. I have clients who tell me if I don't do my meditation or my exercise or I don't eat right, they see the impact the same day or next. There's a direct correlation. So those are the things that you can do to help you uh, function better without the medication. Okay. Um, so one person asking, um, that person is the one with uh, ADHD and holding tendencies. So um, the wife is very uh, frustrated and wants to box up the entire basement uh, with uh, good stuff and stuff that needs to go away um, and put all the stuff in storage to allow a clear space at home and also for um, uh, him to, to manage one box at a time. So um, um, it could be worse that she could have insisted that it all go into the garbage, but she's yeah. not insisting yeah. that yet. So well, the, the, the going directly to the garbage, you will make the person be worse. 
mm -hmm. over time. They, you know, you can go in and do a massive cleanup without their consent or without their agreement on items, and they will make they'll look, become worse afterwards. Shoving stuff in an offsite storage only delays the inevitable. You still have to deal with it, and you're going to be potentially paying hundreds of dollars a month to store stuff that's not even worth that. You know, mm -hmm. you might be spending two hundred dollars a month to, to store. $75 worth of stuff in the end. So you really, it's time to get a, a, a professional in. So it could be an organizer on site or a coach, or maybe it's working with a mental health professional or, or with both uh, that can address things that are on the hoarding uh, excessive behavior uh, type. And it could also be, you know, there are support groups that help with topics like hoarding. Uh, and those, those are self-help groups that can also be some part of the solution. And there's maybe one category where you could say veto, like that couple when I talked about the golf bags, he had veto over tools, she had veto over the memorabilia. So she was going to take some stuff and, and donate it, but I said, let him look at every single item before you go away, because if he realizes that you've thrown stuff out without or given away without his consent, because everything else they had to agree on, he, he will no longer trust the process. So when there were two knapsacks that came up, you know, they had four, he was, a, he, was a, well, let, he had to check every single pocket and she was humming and on. I said, let him go through it. It's the process. So once he makes sure there's nothing in the pockets, then he would say, okay, you can get rid of these two. So you have to go a bit slower to have better results in the long time, term. Okay, so we have two more questions. Yeah. Um, First question is, uh, how do you recommend finding a stalling location when every room in the house is in disarray? I, I, I really don't encourage that. It's like creating a folder of papers to file, right? You, you're just delaying a decision. Uh, whether it's a pile of, of papers that you, you've, you've put in a folder to file, that pile you know, today becomes a box tomorrow. Uh, what I simply do is if I have stuff that I have to file and work in my office, I'll put it on the floor between my desk and my filing cabinet. So every time I get up, I'll go put it away where it belongs. So uh, I, I, this is where you definitely are you're at that stage where you have to get uh, a professional help, either uh, mental health, somebody who works on obsessive compulsive behavior, an organizer or coach or combination of because uh, just finding a storage space to put it if it's not on your property, it just makes no sense. Okay. And uh, one last question, and this is coming from a mom. So how do I handle everyone uh, else's messages in the house and uh, like the kids and the husband? And it feels like that she's the only one picking up after well, everybody. Sanity basket. Okay. Because okay? otherwise you're going to drive yourself nuts. Your family's going to hate you if you're constantly nagging. So if they leave their stuff around, put it in that that sanity basket it was like i said it was a laundry basket we took some made out of wickers a little bit nicer than a laundry basket it was in our front entrance now our front entrance is pretty big but maybe it's in the family room and it, when the kids would leave around i'd go around do a sweep at night i would dump it in there so in the morning they can't find their running shoes they knew where to look simple as that because otherwise you're just gonna create a lot of friction in your family and you may have some point, you may have to just call the collection of toys. So either you do a rotation of stuff, if they're younger ones, put some away uh, and bring them out every month or season and rotate, or you simply uh, let go of some of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. So um, this would conclude our webinar here tonight. Um, for people who are here tonight and also registered, they will... Uh, you will be receiving a, a recording of this webinar uh, by Thursday. And um, on behalf of Kadak, I just want to thank uh, uh, Nani for speaking with us tonight and thank everyone for attending and uh, the questions as well. And um, I, would, I would really appreciate if you have any comments about the presentation, what you like, what you didn't like, or, or just one or two words to describe how you felt, uh, whether it's inspired or overwhelmed. Put it in the comments that will give me some feedback so that I know in the future how to uh, tweak the presentations. And I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, you know, giving up your evening for this and really know that you can uh, make this happen. It's just a question of working on planning and one step at a time. 
this, this didn't accumulate overnight. It's like weight loss. It, it has to go slow because when you go too fast, the weight's going to come back. Well, it's the same concept with clutter, right? The slow, you, you go slow, but, you know, but moving forward and making progress. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. So good night, everyone. All right. Thank you very much.